Hi everybody, Mark Green here, the Diabetes Diet Guy, bringing you information about how to get on top of those tricky glucose levels. Now today's video is a bit of an update. So NICE, which is one of the major bodies in the UK that helps to form guidance for healthcare professionals about managing all different kinds of conditions and diseases, have published their new guidance on type 2 diabetes. Now, obviously, this is going to affect how your glucose levels will be managed going forwards. And so I just wanted to bring the update to you and just to share what's been discussed and how this might inform practice going forwards. So to start things off, let's just think about why this is relevant. Now, obviously, this is the kind of thing that a lot of healthcare professionals will be turning to when they're trying to make decisions with their patients about how to manage diabetes, type two diabetes, I should say. Now, I think the key element here is that a lot of healthcare professionals that ultimately are left to manage conditions like type two diabetes aren't necessarily diabetes specialists. Obviously, you have your specialist teams that might exist in the hospital, or you might see them in specialist diabetes outpatient clinics, but, uh, but the bulk of the work is being done by GP surgeries, diabetes specialist nurse in the GP practice. But keep in mind that although these professionals are very good at their jobs, they're not necessarily just dealing with diabetes day in, day out. The diabetes specialist nurse, for example, might very well also be the asthma nurse and she might be something else nurse. So they might not be getting the exposure that they would usually get if they were based primarily as a diabetes specialist that you would see in someone like my job who's a diabetes specialist day in, day out. That's what I do, as do my colleagues that I work with. So what do we do? We turn to guidelines to help inform us. So this is where we go out and look at the studies that have been published and what the best practice is with the best outcomes based on the medications that are available to us. And as a result, we can then come to a consensus statement amongst many healthcare professionals about the best way to go forwards. Now, of course, this has some interpretation attached to it. So you'll find, for example, the American Diabetes Association's guidelines are slightly different to what you might find in the UK. And the European guidelines in many different countries might slightly differ to what we do here. So it is open to interpretation and how those studies might be used in terms of the application in our practice. So if we travel back in time to have a look at what the guidelines were like at the last publications, it was very much how we see diabetes typically treated uh, in this day and age as we speak. So usually people will go to their first line options, which is usually oral therapies. Metformin typically is the first line therapy. And then historically what would happen is you would have a sulfonylurea added on top of that, like a glyclozide or glimepramide, I can never pronounce this, glimepramide <laughs> um, or glipozide uh, tolbutamide, or that one's slightly outdated these days, um, the zides and the mides, essentially. Um, and then from there, you would then escalate with further oral medications like the DPP-4 inhibitors. They tend to end in glyptins, alogliptin, citagliptin, linagliptin, the list goes on. Um, and then at that point, we'd start looking at potentially injectable therapies like the GLP-1 agonists, and then onto insulin therapies. Obviously, there's a couple of other um, medication classes in there, but typically that was kind of the pathway that would be followed. Now, in recent years, we've had an explosion in the options available to us. And the one of, that is of uh, major interest is the diabetes medication class, the SGLT2 inhibitors. So these are the glyphlozins, like empagliflozin, dapagliflozin, ertugliflozin, and canagliflozin. So you've probably, you might have heard of those, and some of you may even well be on them. Now, the reason this medication class is getting so much um, attention is because actually, as they've done the studies, what's really come out of the studies, which wasn't really expected, is the cardio cardiovascular benefits and the kidney or renal benefits. This was not expected. It was purely a diabetes medication, but actually we find that in cardiovascular disease, the occurrences of problems is much reduced when patients go on to this class of medications. In terms of kidney disease progression, it's slowed down when people go on to these medications. It also has a weight loss effect, keeping in mind that um, type two diabetes is primarily driven for most people by carrying too much weight, so another bonus. Um, so not only does it fit, well, uh, help to reduce the glucose effect, 
It also improves the cardiovascular outcomes, the renal outcomes, and helps you lose weight, which addresses the underlying issue with the diabetes in the first place. To the point where these medications now have their individual licenses for both cardiovascular and renal disease. So you don't even necessarily need to have diabetes to use them, which is generally quite unheard of, particularly for diabetes medications. So actually, when we're thinking about treating type 2 diabetes and, and other types of diabetes as well, we're not just thinking necessarily about the glucose levels. We're thinking in a, a broader terms. We're thinking what other complications come with it. And that is typically cardiovascular disease, renal problems, um, vascular problems, and everything else that comes with it, all those complications you may have heard about with diabetes. So we're thinking about the wider picture. So a medication that helps to tick a lot of those boxes is very desirable and appealing. So as a result, the NICE guidelines have been updated to reflect that. So now this SGLT2 uh, class, drug class category, is actually now considered second line after metformin. If someone can't tolerate metformin, as many people can't because it can cause some gastrointestinal disturbance, actually SGLT2s are now recommended as first line after metformin which is a huge shift in how diabetes has been treated historically. Now, there's still a place for those other diabetes medications like the sulfonylureas, like glycoside, but the problem with these medications are that although they are very effective at lowering glucose levels, they don't really have any of those wider benefits. Metformin itself even has a cardiovascular benefit. So what we're trying to do is get more bang for our buck Rather than just looking at glucose, what else can we use to help lower those other risk factors elsewhere? Which is why things like glycoside and sulfonylureas are moving further down the list. The DPP-4 inhibitors like linagliptin, alogliptin, citagliptin. So again, similar, similar situation with the sulfonylureas. They're modestly effective at lowering glucose, but there's not a great deal of other benefit that comes with them. They have their place, absolutely but they're not really given the wider benefits that the other medication classes are providing. So what you might find in terms of what this means for your treatment is if you have other considerations other than the glucose, you might very well find yourself being recommended one of these medications going forward. So it's a big shift in practice. However, with any guidelines, there are some criticisms. So earlier I mentioned these GLP-1 agonists. So examples of these are things like Victoza, which is um, liraglutide or dulaglutide, semaglutide, azempic. So you might again have heard of these medications. They tend to be a once weekly uh, hormone injection. It's not insulin, but it is a hormone that your body produces, which basically helps to slow down the absorption of food. So it takes the edge off those glucose levels after eating. But GLP-1 as a hormone that you produce is basically a satiety inducing hormone. It fills you up. So it has tremendous weight loss benefits. And this is particularly true for the newer classes like semaglutide and dulaglutide. And they're only getting better and better as they reinvent these medications and progress them. So again, we're thinking about treating that underlying problem of diabetes, which is the weight gain. If we can help people lose weight, we're helping to treat the underlying issue. They also have a cardiovascular benefit. Well, at least some of them do, the ones with the data, but typically, in these classes of medication where there's benefit in one that can be replicated across the class. It just might mean that the um, other medications haven't done the studies yet. So it's helping the glucose levels. It's helping to a certain extent the cardiovascular benefit and it's also treating the underlying cause of the disease. So a triple whammy once again. Now, unfortunately, with the NICE guidelines, because they're still lacking data in terms of the cost effectiveness of these, amongst some other issues, is that they still remain fourth line therapy after these newer recommendations, which is a vast difference from the American guidelines and other guidelines that have been published that are actually positioning these much higher up the, the hierarchy um, in order to maximize people's glucose control and treat that underlying issue of diabetes as soon as possible. So get on top of it early. And we know that there is a legacy effect whereby if you start to treat diabetes quite aggressively, for lack of better expression, early doors, and help them lose weight, there is a legacy effect where actually those people do a lot better longer term. So this is where the NICE guidelines are drawing some criticism because the GLP-1 agonists are still quite low down the uh, food chain, if you will. Um, but hopefully as more data emerges over time, um, we'll see them bumped up a little bit more, possibly replicating the other guidelines that are in existence. 
Finally, just a word on insulin. Obviously, that is still a treatment option and it's a very effective one. But generally speaking, in type 2 diabetes, this tends to be almost a last resort. I know historically people would be scaremongered with insulin. If you don't put your act, if you don't get your act together, you're going to end up on insulin. We're trying to move away from that. It's a perfectly valid treatment option. The problem with going on to insulin, though, is that it doesn't really help anything other than the glucose levels. And it's also an anabolic hormone, which means it helps you store things, including fat, glucose, and therefore it encourages weight gain, which is also true of those sulfonylureas. So although they, so they don't have any other additional benefits other than the glucose, and because they make you gain weight, they actually make the diabetes slightly worse over the longer term because they're not treating that underlying cause. But nonetheless, still perfectly valid treatment option. And for many people, they hit a point where they need insulin. You can't do without it. There's no other options in terms of the tablets. They're not doing the job. So that is definitely still the most effective glucose lowering therapy available. Just lastly, and one thing to keep in mind is that with any guidelines, they are open to interpretation from the healthcare professional. So they're there to guide you. Now, obviously, people, as I said, that do not specialize in diabetes day to day might rely on them a bit more and be a bit more truer to the guidelines as opposed to a specialist that works, you know, day to day in it. They'll obviously try and be as um, led by the guidelines as possible, but they have the practic they have the um, practical experience to apply the guidelines in the context of their own patients and they see so much of it that actually they know when to use the other medication classes, even if it's a bit earlier than what the guidelines might suggest. For example, the GLP-1 agonists. I know in our practice in the hospital that we generally will use those as a pretty first line option for some people that fit the criteria. Generally, they tend to be carrying a bit too much weight, glucose are high, and we'll use that in combination therapy with other things. So the guidelines are there to help guide practice, but we're not a slave to them necessarily. And there you have it guys. So there's a quick update about how things are changing in the world of diabetes. Um, more information will follow hopefully, and as it comes, I will definitely fill you in because ultimately it's your treatment plans that may be altered off the back of this. So it's nothing to worry about, but it is a consideration and just help you maybe understand a little bit more how your healthcare, healthcare professional is thinking. This stuff is available online, so if you just type in nice type 2 diabetes guideline update or something to that effect, you'll find it. It's not the most invigorating read, but it does give you a bit more information for those that are interested. Um, thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.